we uh, welcome you in this final afternoon session of the CTBUH uh, Mumbai conference entitled Advances in Structural Engineering uh, Part 2. The final presentation of the session uh, will be given by uh, Dr. Farshid uh, Berryman and Matthew Esther of W.S. Atkins, Dubai, entitled Hybrid Solutions for Tall Buildings. Please help me welcome Farshad and uh, Matthew. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Matthew Esther from Atkins, and uh, before I go into the substance of my presentation, I'd just like uh, to show a few slides and, uh, and introduce our, our, our practice. Um, we are a UK practice with a, with a global presence. Um, we, we, we have uh, approximately uh, 16,500 engineers and architects operating in, in five regions across the world uh, from uh, 200 offices. And uh, in the region, we've got a strong presence in the Middle East. Uh, we've got offices in, in Bangalore and in India. And uh, we've got uh, an office in the Philippines serving a region uh, as far east as uh, uh, North Africa and all the way down to Northern Australia. The Burj Al Arab in Dubai is where it all began for us, our, our, our story in terms of uh, involvement in high-rise buildings. Now this building uh, pretty much is inextricably associated with Dubai and uh, has since set the standard uh, which subsequent generations of engineers and architects have aspired to maintain. And in the time since then, we have uh, built up a track record of uh, uh, an additional 45 completed tall buildings in the Middle East region. And uh, up until the, the, the credit crisis hit some 18 months ago, there were another uh, 10 or so uh, very significant uh, buildings in the pipeline, two of which we're, we're, we we're, will be looking at covering over the course of our presentation. Uh, we, we, are the, uh, we, we were the architect and engineers for the Bahrain World Trade Center. It was the first uh, building that actually showcased its environmental and sustainable credentials with, uh, with the three turbines that, span on, uh, that sit on three bridges that span between the two towers. This uh, building, which was recently com completed, generates between 12 and 15 percent of its own energy. And uh, it's part of, uh, it, it, it's, it, it's part of uh, uh, the Atkins ethos, which is to make sustainability and, and environmental issues a key part of every, all the facets of design that we're involved in. Now, introducing uh, hybrid mega frames. We've had the opportunity um, in the last few years to be involved in buildings which, due to their configuration, happened to have two cores and needed to bridge an opening in between. Now, um, traditionally, one would probably look at uh, uh, having, uh, the, using the two cores as two separate cantilevers. But what we decided to do is actually uh, tie uh, these cores with uh, a large gravity structure uh, essentially made of steel and mobilize the coupling action between the, the two cores via this, this, this stiff uh, uh, gravity structure. The analogy is pretty similar to that of traditional outriggers, except, uh, but the only difference is that you're actually pairing them. It made uh, uh, for a very efficient use of materials, and uh, uh, it helped us better manage the load around, around the building, uh, minimizing uh, the, the overall over, overturning effects on the base of, uh, of, uh, of the structure and uh, uh, therefore having uh, considerable benefits on the foundation design. There is, however, particular uh, areas where we, one needs to pay attention to detail and these are very local effects which I will, which I will demonstrate later. Now, uh, this is the Icon Hotel which my colleague Fashad will be talking about in a, in a bit more detail. And uh, essentially, the bridging structure across the top of the two core walls uh, effectively 
uh, turn the, the, the system into a, a frame and a very efficient frame where, where, whereby the, the lateral load effects are dissipated between the two cores through framing action. Um, I'd just like to introduce the Trump Tower in Dubai, a project we, 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 that we were involved in. Unfortunately, it's a project that was being put on ice due to the credit crisis, but it would have been a, a, very, a, a, a very interesting project, and it's certainly our hope that it, it, it would one day get built. Now, it sits in the middle of Palm Jumeirah, and it's 267 meters high. Uh, it's got 62 floors, and uh, uh, it is our hope that one day it will be an icon to the area. The, 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 the design progress from, a, from a, an, an initial concept that we inherited and through a certain process we improved the efficiency of the building considerably. We, the, the, the pinnacle of the structure was actually converted into usable space and it's got a theme uh, restaurant uh, at, at, at the pinnacle and at very early stages we were concerned about uh, construction sequence and how it, it would all come together. Now, whilst the architects were going through the various phases of design, we were trying to look, uh, get some form of terms of reference for buildings where cores had actually been coupled. And uh, two such buildings were the Umeda Sky Building in Osaka and the other, the Grand Arche de la Défense in Paris. But these, the, n the most notable difference between the two are the fact that uh, the gravity loads that we would be dealing with would, uh, uh, would be the dominant uh, force effects that we would need to manage through the process. The structure itself consists of two towers. The gravity elements uh, are, consist essentially of uh, concrete columns and, and blade walls. And the load lateral uh, resisting system uh, in one direction is by a pair of uh, punched uh, shear walls. And in the other, in the other direction, is uh, uh, achieved by coupling the two cores that you see at the center uh, of, the, of the slide. These towers are linked at, uh, at level 40, which incidentally is the plant room level, and uh, we, where we used uh, to, to full effect the, f the, 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 the double story heights available there. But unfortunately, well, that space was not enough to span uh, distances that vary between uh, 26 and, and 40 meters. Now, uh, we, we needed a 10-story truss to actually effectively carry the gravity load and uh, the, uh, transfer the, 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 the lateral loads and, 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 and have an, an effective frame between these three elements. Uh, the, the basic structure consists of a pair of uh, uh, coupling trusses spanning between the wall and an outrigger structure that essentially carries the gravity loads. There's, on top of which there's a hierarchy of other structures that we needed to under, uh, whose behavior we needed to understand and that was uh, th th there were two tertiary trusses that carried the, the rest of the, of, the, uh, of the gravity load. Going back to uh, Gary's pre presentation earlier, uh, we had to break uh, the constituent parts of this structure down into, in, in, into its elemental details to actually fully understand its behavior because uh, with the 3D engineering packages uh, that we were using, the, the, the results were somewhat uh, uh, not what we were expecting initially. But after some rational thought and going back to the basics, we did get to the bottom of it. Now this is the array of, uh, of structure that we have on the, on the 40th floor. Um, despite uh, the amount of space used up uh, by the structure, uh, th there was close interaction between uh, the structural engineering team and uh, the MEP team uh, to make uh, full use of the, uh, uh, of the space within the mechanical plant areas. Now, in, in terms while trying to assess the benefits of the coupling action, we actually ran uh, some simple two-dimensional models of what stiffness would be available if we didn't couple the cores together and the benefits of actually coupling it. And as you can see from these, uh, from these two renders, um, 
the, the, the tower on the right has actually got a, a, a reduction in displacement of uh, over 70%, which means that that, that equates to, a, to an almost three or four fold increase in stiffness and has got all the other benefits that come with it. The, the, the structure itself, because it's, it, it's also supporting uh, uh, the gravity loads, um, essentially spends 80% of its time uh, carrying gravity loads with only 20% uh, uh, capacity required, additional capacity required to, to, to sustain the transient loads. Now, in terms of the one area where we, where, where we would need to pay a lot of attention would be, at the sheer, would be the sheer transfer at the top of the connecting part of the coupling truss to the wall. As you can see from that sketch, uh, the blue line represents uh, the, the lateral forces imparted onto the building and uh, with the resulting shear as shown uh, in the pink, uh, the yellow line actually shows the, 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 the amount of uh, horizontal shear that's transferred into the concrete cores. Now, if, we, if one can design and detail the concrete cores to actually sustain that load, you've got a very efficient structure in terms of not having to take all, all these overturning effects down to your foundations. Now, uh, with, with, with such a com complex building, we had to work uh, closely with a contractor and uh, we had the benefit of a lot of support from Tecla who helped us model the construction sequence, which essentially would be the pair of coupling trusses going up first with the outrigger structure following soon after and the, the secondary and tertiary trusses going up after that. On top of that, it, after that, it will just be a normal arrangement of column and beam construction up until completion, which essentially was uh, a, a, a nice sculptured pinnacle. A, another aspect of this project that we had to consider was the adjustments and phasing. And uh, uh, essentially, one side of the building was taller than the other and it actually displaced vertically more, uh, what, uh, the north side displaced more than the, the southern side vertically. And this is something we had to take into account both in terms of the design, in terms of forces in the structural system, and uh, in terms of construction sequence. We, 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 uh, we had a very good relationship with the contractor. This, this project actually went to site, the foundations uh, have actually been put, but as I mentioned earlier, it is on ice and it is our hope they all get built. The contractor themselves were very keen to understand the critical aspects of the design and uh, we, we, we're managing movement in terms of column shortening and uh, movement of the structure would have helped to execute uh, a building which hopefully would end up looking like this. I'd just like to pass a uh, hand over to Fashad, who will be uh, speaking on, uh, about uh, performance-based design associated with the Icon Hotel. Thanks, Matthew. Thanks, Fashad. Good afternoon. Uh, Matthew spoke about the hybrid solution. I just want to show you another project that how, and show you how efficiently we have used combination of different material. This is Icon Hotel. Uh, located in Dubai, you can see in the background Trump Tower and, and uh, Burj Al Arab. It basically is a donut shaped building. Uh, it's a hotel building about 160 meters high and uh, including guest rooms and branded service apartment. In terms of geometry, it's about 160 meter external diameter and about 80 meter internal hollow diameter. When you design a building in Dubai, uh, the first option is concrete because it's a local material, it's available, it's cheap. Con contractors are very much comfortable with concrete. So this is the preconcept we have given to client. Basically, it consists of three punched shear wall wheel-shaped shear wall, stiffened by some cross wall shear wall. As a peer reviewer, we had Leslie Robertson with us, and he had given so many good uh, comments and so many good uh, valuable uh, alternatives. These are showing our, some of our options during the design process. 
during the concept design. As you can see, it's a very complicated building. It has a unique shape. It has a lot of challenges for the construction. So we recommended the client to put the contractor on board at as early a stage as possible. So we had the privilege to work with Samsung. Samsung become on board as a pre-construction advisor. We worked closely with Ahmad Abdul Razza. I, I don't know if he's in the room or not. But we worked together, and these are the alternative options by him. Finally, this is the building a structural system. Uh, basically, it consists of two core, two concrete core, mainly 600 millimeters, starting from the foundation all the way up to the level 40. And it's located on either side of the building, 96 meters apart, and three wheel shaped mega frame, which we call mega frame. Basically, these two core is linked together by a mega truss at mechanical floor and augmented by a steel arch all the way on the top of the building. In terms of gravity load, we wanted to see, this is how we assume that gravity load will be transferred to the structure. As you can see, the, what the steel frame is doing here is basically transferring the gravity load to the concrete. So the con concrete shear wall is the thing that need to, uh, will do the, all the work finally to transfer the load to the foundation. So you can see a lot of load is transferring at different locations to the shear wall, so a lot of challenges to how to make it happen, how to uh, design for these big shear forces. So this is our assumption. This is what we got from the uh, model. As you see, the red, line, red, red showing the compression and t uh, tension is shown by yellow. As I said, it's, it's, a, it's very complicated. It had a lot of challenge for the construction. So we had to make sure that uh, we, we have a uh, scenario for construction, which finally we, we will get the load path as we assumed. And Teclo helped us to uh, make the construction sequence for this building. The point I want to make here is basically we tried to avoid what we wanted to do. We wanted to avoid having the movement of, on the shear wall. Basically, at the beginning, when you start the construction, building tend to move outward. And once you go up, building tend to move inward. So we tried to keep the concrete balance both sides of the shear wall to avoid this movement. In terms of lateral load resisting system, on, in cross direction, it's very simple. Two concrete box wall taking the lateral load. But as Matthew said, we have used the gravity system to couple the core walls and get the benefit of this gravity system. If you look at the behavior, the shear wall basically, if you have a shear wall alone, it, the, the deformation of the shear wall is, ha, has bending configuration. So as you go higher, as you go upper, basically you will have, you will have more drift. You will get less uh, stiffness. But on the other hand, rigid frame is different. Uh, the maximum drift has happening at the lower level. So when you combine them, you will get the uh, reversal of curvature basically will control your drift. In terms of period, I just give you an idea. It's 4.3 second. It's pretty much a stiff building. It's 4.3 second uh, in cross direction and 3.3 second in longitudinal direction. We have done a lot of a special study. I don't want to mention it here. We don't have enough time here. Just, I want to show you the seismic hazard study and the performance-based uh, performance design. Traditionally, in Dubai, United Arab Emirates, we use UBC 97, and we go for Zone 2A. We did the seismic hazard study because building is located on a reclaimed land, so we wanted to see how soil magnified the earthquake. As you, you can see down there, I have compared the results came from the seismic hazard study and UBC 97. As part of this seismic hazard study, so what I wanted to say is basically UBC 97 governed the design, so that was the final design spectra we used. As part of the study, we had a time history record matched with the response spectra. So we used these response uh, time histories to do the nonlinear analysis. 
Uh, Satish and Joe mentioned about the performance-based design. I want to show you a practical use of performance-based design. When I did the performance-based design in this building, I applied uh, three records. Uh, the result showing that the building essentially remained elastic, actually dissipate the energy through the elastic range. I was a bit scared at the beginning because I thought I have designed the building with ductility factor equal to 4.5. So shall I expect some ductility from this building? Shall I go back and reduce the section, reduce the size to get uh, to save some money for client? Actually, the answer is no, because you are using gravity system to get the lateral load, to dissipate the energy. So if you, if you look at the FEMA 356, you will see that it's actually advising to design the gravity system force control. It means don't expect too much ductility from gravity system. Overstrength, redundancy, yes, it can be. This is the usage ratio. You can see the one is the limit. So there are six earthquakes applied. Bending rotation of the wall check, the, uh, she, uh, the a strain of concrete, a strain of a steel, different things. Still, we have limit to, to one. Just to see the weak point on the building, the, the time history we had, we magnified four times to find out some weak point of the building. This is, this is basically nonlinear time history analysis. This is the result of uh, applying the earthquake on the building. You can see a lot of higher mode is active. Not only the first mode, a lot of higher mode is active. As you can see at the corner of the wall, we have some strain gauge. As same as what Joe showed in the real practice, the real uh, test, you can get the strain at the corner of the wall. Here we can virtually get the strain at the corner of the wall. And this is the final thing. Actually, we have some concrete crush, which you see the, uh, we measure the bending rotation of the wall, and you can see the red and, uh, uh, red and yellow is showing basically the building it's, uh, the concrete is crushing. We normally, when we design the concrete shear wall in Dubai, we don't go for boundary element. We do some detailing for the corners, but we don't provide boundary element, confined boundary element. So what I did, I changed the design. I provided boundary element, confined boundary element, and ran the analysis, and I didn't see any crushing. So that was the, res that was the outcome of this uh, performance-based design. Just to conclude, uh, what, uh, we have used a large gravity system to transfer the lateral load. This is possible, but there are some other penalty that we ha you have to be careful. There are a lot of shear between the uh, gravity, uh, transfer of shear between the lat uh, gravity system to the core wall, which need to be taken care of, and some connection design. And as Satish mentioned, basically performance-based design, when you have a very unique shape building, a complex geometry building, then you don't need to stick to the code. You have a lot of uh, new tool to use it and then go for performance-based design. You can design it based on the code, but go for performance-based design. It's available. The tool is available now. It's very easy. Uh, the, the amount of data you will get is too much. You have to process it properly, but it's, practic it's possible. We have done it, and we got a very good result. Thank you very much.